Blessings and welcome everyone to Gospel of Help. This is our live worship service, and we'd like to start with a word of prayer, and my sister will offer a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, Lord, thank you so much once again for allowing us to enter into your gates with thanksgiving. And even now, Lord, I pray that our desire would be that we would seek after thy kingdom, to seek after, to do thy will, and thy will would be accomplished in our lives. Lord, we ask that when the enemy comes in like a flood, that you will lift up a standard, that standard Christ Jesus. Lord, even though the time is short, we know that there is a shelter in the time of storm, abiding in thy words. And we just ask even now that our hearts will be tuned to sing thy grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's start with our first song taken in hymn number 432, Shall We Gather at the River. Hymn number 432, Shall We Gather at the River. Let us sing it all together. Ready? Shall we gather at the river where bad angels beat our drop with this crystal tide forever flowing by the Oh, 
Now we're going to go to hymn number 216, when the roll is called up yonder. Amen. Hymn number 216, when the roll is called up yonder. Let us sing that all together. Ready? One, two. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the Savior rest shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called yonder, I'll be Yes, the young shall bow before him. 
Lift him up, the risen Savior, high amid the waves roar. Lift him up, to see the speaker, now he bids you flee from wrong. Amen. Now we're going to go to our opening song taken from Matthew 24, verse 14, and Revelation 14, verse 6. Let's sing that all mm -hmm. together. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred tongue and people for a witness unto all nations. Good morning and welcome to the School of the Prophets as we open up the Word of God together here at Gospel of Health. Let's go right into a word of prayer as we have a lot to cover, a lot to discuss, a lot to think about and project, proclaim and preach as we truly discuss this last topic in our series of the Advent Method. Let's pray together. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we come to the last session of this series of talks designed to stimulate our minds, our hearts, heavenward in the principles of the plan of salvation and the method and ministry and mission in work for your last people. Please help us understand these concepts as we open them point by point. Please let us understand even message by message what these symbols and these teachings are leading us to see in a last day movement and a last day method to finish the work. Help us. Give us thy Holy Spirit, dear God, because we are in desperate need of it. And because thy word has promised it, help us to not only be converted by the word, but also be guided into all truth by the word. Make truth plain to our hearts and minds as we open thy sacred word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going into the last of a series of talks, which is going to open up many more talks, future talks, future discussions as we have this morning. Again, this is a discussion more so than a sermon. This is a discussion and an a examination of truth rather than really teaching per se, though we're truly teaching the Word of God. We like to discuss these things. It's one-sided because, of course, there's no one t responding to me, but I'm discussing with you some things. We can't expand and show all the scriptures for everything because many of these things have been presented in other messages. This is one message I can say that even though we'll be teaching some parts of it, you cannot look at this message and truly understand it unless you go back to lesson one and two and three and walk all the way down. Most of my messages are able to really give you something if you haven't seen the other message before. But this one, the vital nature of this one hinges upon what we've seen in our previous talks. It really comes together in this message. So please, if you have not gone back to lesson one in this series called the Advent Message, please go back because we're dealing this morning with the schools of the prophets at the end. The schools of the prophets at the end. And we want to discuss and understand what this concept of the school of the prophets is and how, or if some might say, the school of the prophets is another parallel, another prophetic paradigm that is showing us this work to be seen in the end of time by a specific people that come up with a specific message to finish the work. Let's see if we can see that again this evening or sorry, this morning as we come together to study the Word of God and to examine these truths 
We've looked at previously a number of truths, the harvest, the cities of refuge, the jubilee. We've studied these things point by point by point, even spending much time on the jubilee. We want to see again that the school of prophets is God's last method, if you will, last prophetic parallel to help open our minds to what to do in the state that we are in right now. If you've seen in our previous talks where we are, is what Israel is in, as condition in our previous talks, this prayerfully will give you an idea of what we need to be doing and seeing and looking for, being a part of in this final work or at the end. Let's in the word of God, let's in the word of God examine something just to lay a foundation, a biblical foundation for the schools of the prophets or the divine education that God established that there would be revival and formation. Now we could really go back to the book of Genesis, but for sake of time to try and make, not make this a three or four hour talk, I want to narrow down and go to some of the most clearest texts that we can go to to make points clear and also discuss much of it, rehearse much of it that we already studied, that you can go back and find the scriptures in our previous sermons or in our previous series that all of it can come together. I cannot present every scripture. I cannot present every theme, theme or, or, or prophetic uh, picture, if you will. We've studied it all before. It's a work of deep study of the scripture and connections that we can see. I could take a whole series, a whole four or five more talks and deal with the School of the Prophets and how it lines up with the three hundred message in the last day work of the remnant church. That will be a completely other study. Maybe we'll do that one day but we can't do it completely today. We must open your mind. We must open our hearts and minds to see this last symbol or, or theme, the school of the prophets, as a template for end time work. To show that, let's see that in the scriptures, whether they talk at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, any way you look through, when God establishes truth and also desires to reestablish truth, he always brings in a work of educating Teaching, preaching, healing, this work of educating is essential. And that educational work or that school work established individuals that were filled with the truth and with the prophetic gift or the gift to give or receive prophecy, spirit and truth, John 4 says in the New Testament. And this was to be accomplished in every home, in every congregation in every nation, in every part of the world. God wanted the whole world to be filled with the glory of this type of divine education, this divine schooling. And we look at the Word of God. Let's turn to the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy. Let's go to some clear text that will kind of bring this out. In the book of Deuteronomy, we see what God desired to do with Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. We've understood that the coming out of Egypt in the Old Testament is a type, is an example, is a template, is a parallel to the coming out of Babylon at the last days. And we will understand this truth. What did God want to accomplish there, which also he wants to accomplish over the whole world through the gospel with a last day people at the end? Let's see. In Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, we're going to examine something. Deuteronomy 6, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to find out, as we study the word of God together, that the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy through the eleventh chapter of Deuteronomy establishes a prophetic theme that we're going to see throughout the scripture, especially we're going to see it in the last days, or in the books of Daniel Revelation, per se, to make it even more clear. In the New Testament, in the books of Daniel Revelation, these last day teachings of the gospel, prophetically and practically, we're going to see themes expanded upon New Testament, expanded upon the book of Revelation, expanded on the prophecies for the last days. Let's see if we can see in the book of Deuteronomy a message that we see in God connecting this work of the gospel with teaching. And this teaching to be not just rote memorization and secular uh, Greek methods of education, but really looking at heart religion. The ability through the word of God to bring about, to promote, and to receive into the soul, into the heart, 
this hard experience of the gospel. And by this, and keeping this, being able to receive the blessings that what God wants to give. And let's see if this theme that we are going to see here combines teaching or God's school and the harvest. Now again, if you didn't see our previous talks, that may, that may lose you because we've looked at previous talks and found that the harvest is one of the proofs, one of the, the systems given to the Jews through agriculture that showed Bible truth that even leads us to see this form of doing the work in the last day. We saw that previously. If that is true, is God's schools connected with the harvest? Are these two symbols, connect, are these two themes connected together? And do we find that the 6th through 11th chapter of Deuteronomy establishes this theme among many themes in Deuteronomy that we see are prophetic and also gospel uh, packed, if you will, filled with gospel truths? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's see in Deuteronomy 6 how we begin to understand the, the, outfold, the unfolding of this theme through the 6th through 11th chapter of Deuteronomy. Let's see that. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, let's read verse 1 through 7. Deuteronomy 6, chapter, reading verses 1 through 7. Let's see, we see here God establishing this idea of his teaching or his schooling, the individuals receiving the word of God, and their children, and this to be established throughout Israel, and this to be the foundation of them being able to be blessed, even with a harvest. Notice the word. In the book of Deuteronomy 6, let's read verse 1 through 7. It says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. Notice the word, teach you. That ye may or might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. Here again, these teachings are to keep you, to strengthen you, to go into the land and to possess the land. This land or this field or where the harvest was taken, all of this connected with and predicated upon this teaching, receiving it. Notice what it says in verse 2. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged, all the days of thy life, even to the end of time. Verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Not just intellectual religion, but hearing and doing method, doing the truth, doing the commandments, doing the counsel, doing what the word of God says. Let's read verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Notice it starts off with loving God with the heart. Loving God with the heart. Hmm. Notice what it says in verse 6. And these words, which I command thee, these teaching, the word of God, this day shall be in thine heart. Here we see this word was not just to be memorized, not just to be placed intellectually in the heart, but to be placed in the heart to be kept, to be obeyed, to be believed. This was not just rote memorization. This was a heart religion because these words were to be in their heart. This was heart religion. This was receiving the word, even by faith. And notice that this was not to be kept secret or just a private interpretation or something was just for adults. It says in the seventh verse, reading verses one through seven, of course, the seventh verse, Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, and thou shalt teach them again, diligently. Again, here we're talking about establishing schools. Notice what the school is going to be. Thou shalt teach them, teach them, give them the understanding, the way to receive this heart religion based upon my words diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. The schools were first to be established 
in your home and when thou walkest by the way and abroad and when thou liest down and when thou risest up all throughout the day, day and evening classes as it were. Brothers and sisters, this is a message that establishes the truth of God's word and that this word was not just to be written in books and sent out by tract or various publications. It was to be foremost in the heart and to love God with that power with your heart. It says also this experience where you're all not only able to receive the word in the heart, but also to love. Love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Brothers and sisters, this idea of the love of God, being able to receive the word that the love of God is able to be given, this idea of heart religion is the focus and is the result, the gospel. The gospel. And this work was to be communicated to everyone in Israel, beginning with the children, your sons and your daughters, your children were to receive this in their home, from the home, abroad, day and night. When you rise up, when you go to sleep, morning devotion, evening devotion, morning manna, evening meetings, all this was to be a daily work. And this educational system, this school system, this divine teaching, this divine experience, this righteousness, because they were doing right, obeying the right principles, and obeying it from the heart, this was the foundation of Israel's success. This is the foundation of them being able to possess the land and go in and maintain their experience in the land. It was their passport, and it was their ability to stay there. As a matter of fact, when we look at this seventh verse, it says, you shall diligently teach them unto your children. And this concept of binding the hearts of the father and the children, we're also going to see in the book of Malachi as a prophecy for the last days, under the idea that Elijah would come again and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and children to the father. This idea of heart religion, fathers to children, is seen in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's repeated. The same work was done, according to Malachi 4, in the last days by prophet Elijah. Hmm, what does that mean? Let's not go ahead of ourselves. We see in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy a theme concerning this heart religion and teaching this ability to both receive the word into the heart and love God with his experience. Love God with all your heart. This was to be given diligently to the children and diligently to their children's children. It was given, given to all Israel, in the home and abroad, day and night, constantly. This was their ability to enter in the promised land. This was their ability to stay there. This was the foundation of their blessing, the experience of the King of God within them, the experience of Christ in the heart by faith. But let's not stop there. Let's not stop there because this work that we see in chapter 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10, when we come to the 11th chapter, we're talking about the 6th through 11th chapters. When we come to chapter 11, we see that God now makes a final point concerning this point or this theme before he brings it up again later on in a number of places, one of which is the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. That's just for your notes. We'll talk about that in a moment. In the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy, let's see what God says and show you that this teaching that he talks about in the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th chapter is establishing a theme that this teaching, this idea of schools, even schools that will have people with heart religion, is connected with the harvest that was accomplished in the land that flowed with milk and honey giving them the ability to possess the land and receive the benefits of the land. It was all predicated upon this teaching, these schools, this experience. This teaching, these schools, this experience were the foundation of them entering into the promised land, entering into the Canaan land, entering into the heavenly or literal Canaan land, being able to possess it or even possessing 
Jerusalem, which we found out in previous chapters, previous studies, especially Isaiah 61, represents all the world. The ability to receive, enter in and receive all the world and the fruit, the harvest of the world, even in the last days, is based upon this word, this teaching, this experience, this message in the heart. This was the foundation of it. Without these schools, without this teaching, without this experience, there could be no harvest. There could be no fruit. There could be no rain. Let's prove that. Go to the 11th chapter now. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now go to the 11th chapter, Deuteronomy 11. And let's see in Deuteronomy 11 a few verses. Let's read ver first Deuteronomy chapter 11. Let's read verse 8. Verses 8 through 14. Let's begin there. Let's see what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 8 through 14. Is it necessary, is it vital that the schools, that the teachings, that the experience be accomplished in every person in Israel or in Israel generally, that they may possess the land that flows in milk and honey, that they may enter into the land flowing with milk and honey, that they may receive the rain and the harvest and the fruits thereof. Now we're talking about the literal temporal fruits and harvest so on in most minds, but we're also talking about the spiritual harvest, the spiritual fruit, the spiritual work for the last days. And notice what it says in Deuteronomy 11. The 11th chapter of Deuteronomy, looking at verse 8 through 14. Deuteronomy 11, 8 says, Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day. Remember he said in Deuteronomy 6, he told you what it was that ye may be strong and go in and possess the land, whither ye go to possess it, and that ye may prolong your days in the land, where the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land that floweth with milk and honey. For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt, from whence ye came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waters with thy foot as a garden of herbs, and the land whither ye go to possess it, it is a land of valleys, sorry, of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. You don't water this land like Egypt with your foot. This is a land that receives rain. This is a land that is needing rain. This is a different land than the world of Egypt. This is a land that, this is a work, this is a place where you need rain. Hmm. Notice, it says, read it again. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. Verse 12, a land that the Lord thy God careth for, the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. By the way, verse 12 is a proof text that shows that the eyes of the Lord that same eyes the Lord found in the book of Revelation, it has something to do with that year given to the Hebrews, and that year or that Hebrew year is typical, it's prophetic, because the eye, the Holy Spirit is upon it. The Holy Spirit is inspiring, breathing upon it, showing prophetic things from this Jewish year where we had the various feasts that all pointed toward the cross and to the end time events. All these things that were caught up with bulls and goats and so on, but also teaching gospel truths. Those slaying of bulls and goats and those days might have passed away. Yet, the actual gospel truths in Christ, in the end time movement, still have validity. Still are teaching. Do we keep the Passover? No. But do we spiritually keep this sealing work, this work with Christ? Is Christ up? Yes. We must understand that though these ceremonies have passed away, the gospel truths continue, not based upon a day, but based upon every day, fulfilling this gospel work, and also prophetically filling in their order all the way down the line, prophetic events until Christ comes to take us home. Notice again, we're in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11, the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy. We read verse 12. We just made a mention that this is prophetic. I'm trying not to... Just pull out so many of the prophetic things here. It's so difficult not to, to, to stay here, but I have so little time to deal with. Deuteronomy 11, let's read verse 13 and 14 as we close this section. 
Verse 13 of Deuteronomy 11 says this, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Remember, we just read that in the sixth chapter, 6 through 11. It's all just one thought, one theme being established here. Verse 14, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. Did you see that? The teachings found in the sixth chapter continue on building a theme all the way to the 11th chapter. And the idea of this word and this teaching, these schools, this experience must be possessed in the heart that we may love God with all our heart. That we may be faithful and not have the land spit us out. That we may be able to obtain the rain and receive our corn and wine and so on from the field or the harvest. The rain and the harvest are connected with the teachings. The rain and the harvest is connected with the schools or the prophets, as it were, or these schools that would be established throughout the time of Israel to do a special work. Now you say, well, what are these schools? Let's, let's, let's just make one point before we go there. We're going to go there quickly. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, let's read just the counterwise now, because we just read that if you do obey, receive the experience, teach it, continue this educational work, this spiritual work, this prophetic school work in the heart, the harvest will be accomplished because the rain will come. The rain will be coming in its season, early rain and latter rain, and develop the harvest, literal harvest, and also a end time harvest in the world. We're talking about prophetic language now. But what if we don't do that? What if we think that this is foolishness? This is old-fashioned. What do we think the idea of an investigative judgment and the idea of a true spiritual righteous by faith with this victory over sin is all legalism? What if we just toss all this idea, this heart religion to the side and go with a social gospel, a secular gospel, a even race-based identity gospel? What happens then? Notice in Deuteronomy 11. Let's read verse 26 through 28. I'm sorry. Let's read verse 16 through 19. Deuteronomy 11, verse 16 through 19. It says, Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. This teaching was worship. This teaching was serving God. It says, verse 17, And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth thee. Could it be that because we have not been obedient in this and also in the spiritual experience, teaching the message, receiving it, that there's no rain, and that there's no blessing upon us, and that we're perishing quickly off the land, Look at verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as floods between your eyes and ye shall teach them your children speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way even or when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Do you see the difference there? Do and live. Don't and receive the wrath of God or the punishment. And don't think that this idea of the wrath of God being poured out does not have an end time application. See in the book of Revelation. We won't go there for those that are students of the word of God. Let's again notice that this truth of obey and live, don't obey or disregard or disobey God and perish is also likened to another Understanding. Notice it in the book of Deuteronomy 11. Let's make it quick here. Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 to 28. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26 to 28. Notice what it says here. Notice how it compares the good and the bad, obedience and disobedience, and the results thereof. In Deuteronomy 11, verse 26 to 28, it says, Behold, Deuteronomy 11, 26, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, 
but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day and go after other gods which ye have not known. This understanding from Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 11, this understanding seen in the 11th chapter in the verse we just read gives you context so that when you go to the 20th chapter of Deuteronomy, we're not going to go there right now, in the 20th chapter of Deuteronomy when it talks about the blessings and cursings, you have context and definition here. When it talks about the blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy 28, it talks about the sicknesses and diseases and the lack of harvest and the palmer worm and the canker worm and all the eating of the crops and the sky being as brass and not giving its rain. Now we have context based upon these chapters of what is we talking about. What is the reason why the 20 chapters have such terrible diseases and sicknesses or curses from disobeying it and blessings from obeying because it goes right back to what was taught by most of the people that they may have this experience this teaching this type of schooling to educate and create a righteous nation a righteous congregation a righteous people throughout the world and just as it's been faulty and failing here and in Bible history, it's been faulty and failing in our generation, causing similar curses, similar wrath to fall upon us, which we'll see in greater wrath for even those that claim to be God's last day people. Teaching. So what would be the way to come back if we've fallen away? Get back to the teaching. Get back to the schools, even schools of the prophet, so that the harvest can come. Hmm. We found out that this work is called the schools of the prophets. Now let's just recap for those that weren't with us. On our previous lessons, just take a few seconds, our previous lessons we talked about a few things. Let's talk about the harvest first because we started there. This harvest we found out in the 61st chapter of Isaiah represented not only Israel but also Israel was a type of all the world. The fruit of the harvest that God's looking for is in all the world. Zion's fruit must grow in all the world. This gospel is preached in all the world. This last day work is not seen in a literal Jerusalem. It's a type, a prophetic symbol for all the world. What Christ did in the gospels, in the cities of Jerusalem, was a type for the work to be seen in all the world. Local, literal Jerusalem, future spiritual, worldwide, end time application. We see it here in the scriptures. As we understand this and understand the idea of the harvest, this idea of the harvest we studied in the whole study, we looked at the idea of the harvest and what God said about this work that needed to be done for the stranger, for the poor, for the widows, for the cast out, giving them justice, doing unto them as the least of these your brethren. This concept of the harvest also was seen not just in good works and doing good unto the poor and needy, but also it was a type, it was a symbol of reaping souls to the gospel, reaping and developing fruit of character in souls, trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord all over the world, in congregations, in homes, in two or three gathered together, all over the world, in all nations, this was to be accomplished through the gospel, through the message. The message in the heart that causes the development for the, the children of God were to grow like the grass, grow like a tree planted by the rivers of water, a divine planting, and a harvest was to be seen at the end of the world. A true harvest, and Israel or the church or God's people were not to be as barren fig trees, cumbering the ground with the pretension by leaves of fruit, but having none. That tree was to be plucked up and to be removed, according to the parable. When we look at the word of God, we're seeing parallels for the last days. And this idea of the harvest was a strong teaching. We found out in the book of Mark, I believe it is, Matthew, the ninth chapter, that Jesus take this idea of the harvest, the symbol of the end time work, which we saw in Revelation 14, is the work that Christ comes in the cloud to do, to reap the harvest, meaning that the fruit has been developed before he comes, Meaning that this three angels' message is the institute, because we're in 14, 
Remember, I hope you were with us in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. The three hundred message is preached in all the world. Every kindred, tongue, nation hears this message. 14 and on, Revelation 14, 14 and on, we see Christ come in the cloud. He has a sickle. He reaps the earth. But the harvest of the earth is ripe. The three angels' message develops saints. The three angels' message develops the harvest. Christ comes and he sickles and puts in the harvest. Puts in the sickle because the harvest is right. The character, fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace. The character has been developed in the people of God. How? Because of the three angels' message. The same message develops saints. Revelation 14, 12. The same message develops the harvest of the earth. Three angels' message, harvest, same thing. Christ in Matthew 9 says that as he looked upon the church in his day, with all the synagogues, with the great temple center, all the teachers and preachers, all the organization they had, he said these people are fainting. These people are scattered as having no shepherd. How? Was Nicodemus not a teacher? What about all these scribes and Pharisees? Christ said they had no shepherd because the message and the ministry they were doing was not God's ministry. And God did not send his son to put this new cloth on the old garment of failed ministry, of strange ministry, of a new organization. Christ's ministry was too pure, too holy, too true, too right to be connected with. He would be giving over the souls, the, the, the fruits of his labor, to the worst enemies of the gospel, unless they were converted. And we are doing the same thing, many of us, today, hoping that someday it'll all turn right, as people for 100 years have been hoping the same, and it hasn't happened. This type of failing to be true to the Lord and to his work must come to an end. There must be a true working in right lines. And when we understand this idea of the harvest, and Christ's message in Matthew 9, that his teaching, preaching, and healing, his method of working the cities and villages, was the true type of labor. And he was the true example of a laborer that must be a shepherd to the flock. Christ said to pray to the Lord of harvest that he would send laborers like himself that are preaching, teaching, and healing in every city, in every village, in every city, and the outskirts therein, in this preaching, healing, teaching method, that the end may come. This is the teaching that we found. The three message, harvest connected. Harvest, jubilee connected. Harvest, schools, schools of the prophets. This idea of teach connected. Harvest, Israel, cities of refuge, connected. We've connected all these themes together. So if this is true, and we understand that there must be liberty. Now we're going to Jubilee now. There must be liberty proclaimed in all Israel. All Israel is all the world. It's the gospel work. This liberty that we understand is the message that ripens the harvest. This message of the Jubilee is the message of the Day of Atonement. The Jubilee trumpet and the day of atonement trumpet blew on the same day. The jubilee and the day of atonement began at the same time. In our last days, when did the hour of his judgment come? If it came in 1844, even October 22nd, 1844, then when did the jubilee start? Same time. Meaning that the same time this investigation of judgment started, at the same time God wanted this system of justice the system of social justice, justice for people, this message, this method to be seen, and this trumpet, Isaiah 20, Isaiah 58's trumpet is the trumpet of the Day of Atonement. Isaiah 58's trumpet is the trumpet of the Jubilee. Are you still with me? Did I lose you? Are we going down too deep? Do you need to get your scuba gear? Are all these things coming together? If it's not coming together clearly, don't worry, this is being recorded. You can always go back and look at it again, and especially go back to the previous message, watch them again, and as your second, maybe third time, some people, it'll click for you. All these things connect together. They're leading us to see a deeper understanding of truth than just the surface reader can see. And this is why we're in such a dangerous time, because there's so many voices saying a majority of nonsense. But the people don't know, because very few people 
are sharing systematically Daniel Revelation. And some of the people that are trying to don't know what they're talking about. Do you know what you're talking about? How do you know? There must be clear light so people can know just predictions or suppositions and thus saith the Lord. Taking a guess at what the scripture means in Revelation and having proof text to show what it means. We have come to see that the cities of refuge that were close by every city so that anyone finding themselves guilty and or accused of guilty or being chased by the slayer of blood, the avenger of blood, could flee to places where there was refuge. Flee from the cities to places of refuge where they could be healed, where they could be engaged with spiritual individuals, priests of the Lord, preachers, a great environment, a spiritual environment. They could be restored. They could be put to work. They can understand the symbols of the harvest. They can understand the, the way to redeem and change their life. They could be in the company of these cities of refuge, these tabernacles, these places of, of refuge, for the refugee, you would call them, the sanctuaries, if you will, places of sanctuary. They would be there till the high priest died or till the high priest ended his service. The high priest in the most holy place won't end his service until the judgment is over. When the judgment is over, then they'll be free to be reunited with their family. This is all the gospel. It's all leading us to the promise. It's all leading us to the work of the final work of the people of God and heaven being our home. All these things come together. All this is showing us that when we talk about the Day of Atonement and the message in Revelation 14 that brings us that, this idea of the harvest connected with that, the idea of the school of the prophets and the... the cities of refuge, all being connected together. We must see that it's all showing us an end time work, an end time work. But let us not tarry too long the one. Let's, let's make it even plainer for you. Let's, let's, again, break it down in a way that prayerfully it'll make it plainer to you. I want you to see this before we make some applications to our day. The School of the Prophets. In Malachi 4, In Malachi's fourth chapter, we see a prophecy. <clears throat> Let's go there quickly. Malachi 4. Malachi 4. Oh, I don't want this to take a long time, but sometimes you just have to look at some scriptures. You have to look at some of them. In Malachi's fourth chapter, because again, we talked about all these different things showing us the last days, okay? In the fourth chapter of Malachi, it says, beginning with verse 5, Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you... Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the father to the children. Isn't that what we saw in Deuteronomy 6? The men, the fathers were told to teach this stuff to your children. This heart religion, this experience, this teaching of the word, this message. Hmm. That they would keep it in their heart. This says he'll send Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts that children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Didn't we see that failing to keep this heart religion, this educational work, this school work, would not only keep the harvest and the rain from coming, but it would cause us to be cursed or to have a curse. What was that curse? The Bible says God's wrath be poured out upon you for disobeying, and this disobeying would be a curse. The curses that we see is the wrath of God. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Turn the hearts before God brings his wrath, before God brings his curse. So in the last days, before the wrath of God falls, the revelation tells us that the wrath of God is summed up in the seven last plagues. Before the plagues are poured out, the seven last plagues are poured out in the last days. God is going to have a movement, a movement, a movement seen and prophesied under the heading of the coming of the prophet Elijah. Now you say, is the literal Elijah coming? Well, 
when we look at the New Testament, did John come in the spirit and power of Elijah? Did John fulfill the prophecy of Malachi 4? Jesus said he did. And according to the book of Luke, Luke's first chapter says that this child, John the Baptist, this child is for the rise and fall of some, or that he would cause a revival, I should say, for some, and he would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Not literally Elijah coming from the grave. It was talking about a person or a people coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. That which was in the Old Testament, literal and local, has future worldwide significance. Not a literal Elijah in the last days, future worldwide movement. As John the Baptist came to literal Israel in a partial fulfillment, Israel is a type of all the world. There will be a movement all over the world where we see the work that Elijah did. And the work that Elijah did, we again, look at the book of 1st of, uh, uh, and 2nd Kings, we see a message and a revival needed and coming. What revival came? A revival came where Elijah told the king, King Ahab, that it would not rain nor do in Israel except by his word. What word did Elijah have that he said it would not rain by? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 28, said it would not rain unless they kept the experience, the teaching, the message of the sixth chapter, which is the message of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and, and is the message of the gospel. Hmm. Elijah knew that the rain could not come unless these schools were reestablished. So he didn't just preach this message, he established schools. He knew the rain could not come unless they were taught, or people were taught, this heart really didn't have this experience. So he taught young men and gave them a message of truth, gave them experience, and they received the Holy Spirit and received gifts among which to prophesy. Not only to receive prophecies, but also being able to teach and preach prophecies is prophesying. This was poured out, according to the book of Joel, upon all flesh in the last days. Why? Because it was poured out in the time of Elijah. Now, where did Elijah get this idea of starting these schools? Well, Elijah reestablished schools that were established way before him. Look at the book of 1 Samuel. The prophet Samuel... After the days of Moses, Moses went off the scene, there were judges that took control of Israel and guided Israel. God selected individuals by his own spirit. Men select people. God actually, well, God selects people by his Holy Spirit, and men through voting t tend to try and elect people. Men deal with elections. God deal with selection. Like he selected Moses. He didn't, wasn't voted in. God selected him by his spirit. And so God selected a man by the name of Samuel. And Samuel, in his day, when he saw the apostasy come in from the trio teachings of Deuteronomy and saw the condition that the temple and the people were in, he knew that the only way there could be righteousness, only way there could be revival, is to get back the teaching, get back to the message and also to establish schools to do so that was not happening in the homes. It was not being taught by the teachers, the preachers, the ministers. He knew it had to get back to this. So what did Samuel do? Look at 1 Samuel 19. Samuel established schools in his home in Ramah in various parts of Israel and he gathered young men, holy, consecrated men, to share with them this experience. This type of schooling, this type of education, that this heart religion could start to reestablish, rekindle, reform Israel. Notice what it says in 1 Samuel. Turn to 1 Samuel 19. 1 Samuel, we're in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 19 and verse 20. Look at this, this very, very good text. 1 Samuel 19. 1 Samuel 19. And look at verse 20. 1 Samuel 19. And let's see that when we look at the Word of God, we can see that Samuel was the leader, was the teacher, was the principal over 
groups of men that prophesy, or the, what's called the sons of the prophets. Do a word search on the term sons of the prophets, and you find it throughout the Old Testament where the schools of the prophets were basically placed where the sons of the prophets, because they were children of the people. Remember Deuteronomy 6 says, teach your children. They were called sons, because these were the children of the Lord. The sons of the prophets were these children in the schools of Deuteronomy chapter 6. The schools schools of the prophets. Now you see why it's called that. 1 Samuel 19 and verse 20. 1 Samuel 19 20. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. Here we see in 1 Samuel 19, that when Saul sent men to try and take David, because David was actually there hiding at the school of prophets and being blessed and educated and uplifted there. They came and saw a group of men and Samuel educating, appointed, leading out in these schools, in these educational centers where the gifts of the Spirit were so heavy that those came and looked on Receive the Spirit of God and receive both not only understanding but also inspiration, brothers and sisters, the power of the gospel, the power to liberate and eradicate those from sin. The Word of God shows Samuel from various scriptures. We can go to a number of them, various scriptures as the leader of this school of the prophets. Now, did he establish this concept, brothers and sisters? Moses taught and established it in Deuteronomy 6 based upon God's word back earlier than Samuel. So who was the real leader of the school of prophets? You could say it was Moses. But again, truly, the, the, um, the preeminence in all things spiritual must go to Christ because Christ established this all the way back in the Garden of Eden with his Eden school where nature was a textbook and angels were teachers and God himself came in the evening to walk with them in the way and teach them the way that they should go. The same teaching we found in Romans chapter 6, Christ did it with Adam and Eve in the garden. This is a truth that we find all throughout the scriptures. But when we look at the story of Samuel, Samuel established these schools and when he established these schools to try and stem the tide of apostasy that was coming in due to the sons of the high priest and the high priest's uh, apostasy, if you call it. This revival that began with Samuel did not last long because as Samuel began to work, as Samuel began to work to try and gather God's remnant people, as it were, that were scattered because of apostasy, they soon went into a process of reorganization. And what was the leading of God through the prophets leading of God through the spirit of prophecy and the word, the establishing of God's sanctuary truth, they reorganized and made a king over Israel. They wanted to have a centralized organization. Now, did they need organization? Of course. Was organization essential? It was. Was clear gospel organization, thorough, widespread, and effective? Yes. But this reorganization under this idea of the worldly model of a king was a rejection, the Bible says, of God. A rejection of his kingship and leadership over them. But God suffered it to teach divine truth. This idea of the coming of the kings led them into apostasy. And even the schools of the prophets fell into disrepute, disarray, and also apostasy. Samuel died. Many of the prophets that were from those schools went on to sleep, and apostasy crept in, and darkness came back over Israel. And there in the time of Ahab, king of Israel, there in the apostle of Ahab, bringing in Jezebel. And we know who Jezebel is, don't we? Jezebel is identified in the second chapter of Revelation under the church of Thyatira. That same Jezebel of Revelation 2 is the same beast power of Revelation 14. The same power that we're warned of in the second angel's message, sorry, pardon me, in the third angel's message, giving us a warning to choose between the seal or the mark, that same power is the power of Jezebel. Hmm. If the power in the 30s message we're warned against, called the beast, is also Jezebel, according to Revelation chapter 2, then 
if Jezebel is seen the last days on the three news message, then who is Ahab? And if Jezebel is there and Ahab is there over God's people or the organized church, then where is Elijah? Are we talking about a literal man, Ahab, one? Or a literal woman? Or are we talking about a system and a movement? A system and a worldwide movement. And even Elijah is not an individual. Every fanatic and false prophet wants to call themselves Elijah. Elijah represents an end time movement. Future, worldwide, spiritual. Those that don't understand the scriptures, many times want to say they have prophecies. Those that understand or know the word of God hasn't been revealed to them, claim to have dreams and revelations. Brothers and sisters, let us not be weary in well-doing and, and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due seasons we shall reap if we faint not under false teachings, false concepts, error and the shaking time nonsense. Let us be students, Berean students of the word. As we look at the word of God, this work that was done in the time of Samuel went all the way till Samuel died and a few people held up the light. But brothers and sisters, in the time of the kings, deep apostasy came in. Even the school of the prophets eventually came to naught. In the time of Ahab, the prophets were being hunted down and hidden away. Elijah comes on the scene. Elijah comes out of nowhere. You don't see anything about his father or his mother. He has no lineage. He comes seemingly out of nowhere because the Spirit of God comes upon him and he does the will of God. He gives a message of stern rebuke. But who gave him authority? Was he a priest? No. Was he a Levite? No. Where did he get his authority from? It was from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God fell upon him in understanding and also in zeal to do God's work and to do it faithfully. He preached and said that it would not reign except by his word because his word was that received text, that received word, that righteousness by faith spoken of in Deuteronomy. And he knew without this experience and without these schools, this teaching, Deuteronomy 6 talks about, this educational work in the heart every day, rising up, going down, in the way, in the whole, without that establishing, there would be no rain. Yes, the apostasy is evil. Yes, the sins are bad. But what was even worse is not reestablishing the right work to bring about revival. But how many ministries and ministers are today preaching prophecy but not doing this work, not establishing the schools, and in the way God said, not establishing the preaching, teaching, and healing that the harvest could be brought in. Are you following me? This work that we see Elijah to do is connected with the schools of the prophets. Because again, if we look at the word of God, we see that God, through Elijah, established schools. We see it throughout the scriptures. Again, look at that term schools, I'm sorry, sons of the prophets. Let me read something for you quickly. I'm going to read something for you. I'm going to have a handout in this message. With our other handouts, we have in every one of our messages, but we have a special message, a special handout called the schools of the prophets, the ancient schools of the prophets that has some of the quotations. Let me read a quotation. Prophet and Kings, 224, 225. Prophet and Kings, 224, 225. It says the schools of the prophets established by Samuel had fallen into decay during the years of Israel's apostasy. Elijah reestablished these schools, making provision for young men to gain an education that would lead them to magnify the law and make it honorable. Three of these schools, one at Gilgal, one at Bethel, and one at Jericho, are mentioned in the record. Now, by the way, if you add up the various schools that are mentioned, there's six altogether mentioned throughout Israel. Just like there were six cities of refuge close by so people could run to them and be given sanctuary and so on and educated. There were also six schools of the prophets. Again, all these things connect together. The harvest, the schools of the prophets, the, the cities of refuge, all these things come together just perfectly. It says this. Notice this quotation. Just before Elijah was taken to heaven, he and Elisha visited the centers of training. The heart of Elijah was cheered as he saw what was being accomplished by means of these schools. Listen. The work of reformation was not complete, but he could see throughout the kingdom a verification 
of the word of the Lord, quoting, notice what, notice what prophecy is being quoted here, a verification of the word of the Lord, quote, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal. Now, brothers and sisters, how many times have you heard when anyone talks about what is actually happening now and the possibilities that must be dealt with and corrected? Oh, well, God has 7,000. Brothers and sisters, how was Elijah and Elisha's heart cheered? when they saw that through the school of the prophets, God was verifying his word. Through the school of the prophets, by getting back to this work, they were establishing, and this 7,000 was being made up. The work of Reformation wasn't finished, but they were making up this number through the schools of the prophets. Can we preach that, or believe that, or teach that, or know that, and still say, well, I'll just make a digital ministry. I'll just make a, a YouTube ministry. I'll just preach. I'll just do newscasts and recap the news. I'll just talk about what the Jesuits are doing, brothers and sisters, without this outline. Not just having a farm, not just being in the country, hiding somewhere off the grid. We're talking about having a ministry, having an Advent method that God's justice and truth and gospel and redeeming grace can be seen in every country in every part of the world, in every language, that the harvest, the cities of refuge, the work of the Jubilee, the schools of the prophets may be all over the world. This work could be completely flooding the world. And you may say, well, <clears throat> where would this be done? Brothers and sisters, when God established his church, after the passing of time in 1844, when this Jubilee trumpet blew and this Day of Atonement trumpet blew, and these cities of refuge were to be established, these schools of the prophets also be established. And guess what? God's remnant church was to be and is a fulfillment of this Elijah movement in all the world. And how do we know? Because at its inception, it began this work as Elijah did. It began this work of giving a stern message of rebuke to both Ahab and Jezebel. See, some people only want to talk about Jezebel and what the son-in-law is doing. But Elijah rebuked Ahab and Jezebel, the church and the worldly church, the church and the world. And this work that we see is seen in the three angels' message because the beast power, according to Revelation 2, is Jezebel. This type must be understood. And what is the work of Elijah? Just rebuking the church? rebuking the fallen church and rebuking the world? No, it's also establishing it's educational work because this is how revival will come. In the Protestant churches as a first type with God's remnant church and also in the remnant church again. Because remember, you had Samuel, then the very work that Samuel established fell into apostles. Or you had Moses, if you want to put it that way, Moses, then Samuel, then Elijah. Moses, a posse comes in, Samuel. Samuel, a posse comes in. Whether you put it by two or three, the work starts, a posse comes, there's a revival, and a posse, and in the last days, a final work of Elijah. Brothers and sisters, when we look at this, we're seeing that this work of Elijah must accompany a work of establishing schools. And if you do a careful study in the pen of inspiration, you're gonna find that over and over and over again, we look at these institutions. What are we told these institutions to be run by? What are our churches with our church schools to be run like? Because you know the church is more established for Sabbath school than for preaching. She said we shouldn't really do that much preaching. Preaching is good, preaching is needed, but we should do much more teaching. Are our sermons places where we take attendance? Do we have a special book passed out for our sermons? Do we usually have baptism from our sermons? Or the Sabbath school organized for evangelistic labor? Our Sabbath schools are systematic. Our Sabbath schools are the main functioning work of our Sabbath service, our church, or should be. At one time it was, but now there's nothing to preach because the message is gone, so they're just having skits and plays and all kind of, you know, Oh, brothers and sisters, it's, what, what has happened to us? 
what is what has happened to the sons of Kish? What, what has happened? And more so, how are we so blind not to see it? Brothers, as we look at this work and we understand this, the Sabbath school, the work of the church, what was it supposed to be like? What about this idea of the health centers we're supposed to have? Missionary colleges? Publishing houses? What were these institutions supposed to be run like? Can I read some quotations for you? Just a few. General Conference Bulletin, April 1st, 1898. Quote, our churches should be after the order of the schools of the prophets. General Conference Bulletin, April 1, 1898, paragraph 3. Our schools should be after the order of the schools of the prophets. Schools should be after the order of schools of the prophets. So when we talk about this format, this format is not only the harvest, not only the cities of refuge, not only the jubilee, it's also dealing with what? Schools of the prophets. Let's read some more. It says, and we, again, let's, let's go over here. In all our churches, here's a church, in all our churches and wherever there is a company of believers, church schools should be established. So what should be seen here in the churches? Church schools. Where? Sabbath school and also schools for the youth that are throughout the week. If at all possible, but they should be. This is a, a, a purpose of having these. Not just to have... Uh, one a, once a day or two times a day, little hour meeting. No, it was supposed to be places to start an educational work, to start this Deuteronomy 6 work. This is taken from Southern Watchmen, July 18th. This is found in a number of places, but this is one. Ju Southern Watchmen, July 18th, 1899. In all our churches, and wherever there's a company of believers, church schools should be established. And in these schools, there should be teachers who have the true missionary spirit, for the children are to be trained to become missionaries. These schools, established in different localities and conducted, or conducted by God-fearing men and women, as the case demands, should be built upon the same principles as were the schools of the prophets. Southern Watchmen, July 18, 1899. What about sanitariums and publishing houses? It says, this is taken from Manuscript 187, 1905. Manuscript 187, 1905. It says, it has always been presented to me that our publishing houses are sanitariums. Our schools should be more after the order of the schools of the prophets. We are to be watching every development of our own character so that it shall not mediate against the work of the Holy Spirit of God. There's much more I could put there. I can show you a quotation where she says, Our restaurants should be conducted as the order of the school of the prophets. The school of the prophets is the blueprint for all this type of labor because this is what was being done in some form by these people. Our preaching, teaching, healing work was done by Elijah and by Elisha and by John the Baptist and by Christ and by the disciples and by a final movement in this last day. Brothers and sisters, let's come to the point because there's so much I have here to, to, to deal with. There's so much I want to talk about, but let's, let's cut to the chase because we've been here a long time and I don't want to, to weary your mind more than it has been wearied. Do you see a parallel to our day in the story of Samuel and Elijah or even Moses, Samuel, Elijah? Do you see where this movement was started by God and came out of Egypt or out of Babylon as it were? And this movement and this educational work was established, the sanctuary truth was established, all these things were teaching and guiding a people to get to the promised land, and then apostasy comes in. And apostasy comes in, and there's a falling away, but God reestablishes, brings revival. Samuel now. Brings revival. And by this revival, the school of the prophet system is again brought to, the, to bear and is a way that God brings revival and reformation. But where are these schools now? Where are these missionary colleges that especially the prophet of the Lord 
helped to establish. Where's Oakwood now? Where are all these missionary colleges now? Ordered after the school of the prophets model. Where are they? Have they fallen to the same apostasy that Samuel's school did after the death of Samuel? Have they fallen to the same condition? And is there a need in these last days, just before the plagues are poured out, just before the end of time, just before Christ comes, for Elijah to come? Remember, Elijah, or this Elijah of the Old Testament, this Elijah, even John the Baptist, was to be seen in the moon at the end of time, which God established his Advent church to be. However, as we see this apostasy coming in, we see the deepening shadows, and it's time to see Elijah. This is why you see people popping up saying that they literally, persons are saying, I'm Elijah, or trying to infer that they are Elijah to come, a, a individual, and not individuals coming up and doing this type of work, or preaching systematically the message of the three in the message from Daniel, chapter by chapter by chapter, Revelation, chapter by chapter, and showing this message, raising up a foundation of scripture to show the great Advent movement and its triumph, righteous by faith, preaching, teaching, and healing. What did Christ say? Labors are few. What labors? Labors that are preaching, teaching, and healing. Labors that are doing this type of work as Christ was in every city, in every village. Christ was doing this work. What work? Healing work. Teaching work. When in the cities, doing house-to-house -house work. What did he send the disciples to go? House-to-house. -house. Personal labor, even at the well. Even with Nicodemus, personal labor. City evangelism. Brothers and sisters, this work for the end will finish the work, but there must be schools of the problem. Now again, brothers and sisters, you may say, well, where are we looking, brothers and sisters? It could start with you being converted. It could be starting with you hearing these messages that's being presented by this ministry and other ministries presenting a specific gospel that you may understand the mission, the prophecies, the work of revival connected with this work, this heart work, this heart religion. The three hundred message received in the heart. But says, where's the heart? This work of Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the sealing work. The work of the school of the prophets is the sealing work the work of the Holy Spirit in early reign and latter reign power. Brothers and sisters, Elijah did not work for Ahab. He was not a part of the system there because it had fallen to a posse. He was not a part of Ahab's schools or the corrupt schools of the prophets. He established his own based upon right principles. Don't let someone tell you the latter reign is going to come just because they believe that they want to keep their job in apostate schools and apostate system. Don't let someone tell you that when you look at the symbols and the teachings of the Word of God. Don't let someone tell you that John the Baptist worked for the synagogue system. John the Baptist was in the wilderness preaching at a self-supporting institution because it was not accepted or recognized by the church. How many people are trying to be accepted and recognized? Why? Because either the leaders don't see their message as being strong enough to do anything to the apostles that they're involved in, or they don't think that it is, has any merit to do anything against it. Brothers and sisters, this is the time that we're living in. And let us not be fooled concerning the work of Samuel or Moses and Elijah. Don't be confused, confused concerning this idea of the school of the prophets and that's the vital work that must be done. We see it because we're in the old school, supposed should be done like school, like school of the prophets. The sanitariums, the schools and missionary colleges, all this work, publishing work, all this should be done like schools of the prophet. It should be a teaching work with young people coming being trained to take over all these institutions, being trained to preach, to present the word, to do healing work, even gospel medical missionary, gospel health evangelists. What more shall we say? This is the work for the last days. And we really see the harvest, the cities of refuge, the jubilee, or any of these types, especially the school of prophets, coming together like this, we're seeing that God's given us a template for the end times. And we'll see 
and we'll continue to see people that want to start only a media ministry, only do preaching, only do even schools that don't truly give the rounded work. Some would say, well, we have a school, and we're doing a school, and we're raising up people and giving them the three angels' message. But are they being taught to do medical missionary work? And are they being taught to do and present the prophecies, all of them? And are they being taught to do this work so that they can be faithful to God or faithful to the conference? So many individuals will go to these schools that supposedly are these modern school of prophets, and then they find that they have to go to Andrews or one of these state sponsors, state accredited institutions to be able to preach? How is that the school of the prophets? And then you have some on the other side that claim that they are the school of the prophets because they're teaching one of the errors of the days where they focus as if the teaching concerning the nature of the Holy Spirit is the true sealing work rather than the message of the three angels' message being the sealing work and the sealing message. Or the idea of the various prophecies that they have taken from the path that God has put down and now hmm, these things are present truth. Brothers and sisters, there are a multitude of false doctrines and false principles and false prophets and prophets rising up saying that they have schools of the prophets. How will we know who and what is true? To the law and to the testimony, brothers and sisters. This is why we have to get into those nine volumes for yourself. Not my interpretation, not what thus saith the Lord. Get into the conflict series yourself. Get into the 26 original books, the nine volumes of testimonies, conflict series, great controversy, Acts of the Apostles, great um, um, Patriarch and Prophet, Prophets and Kings. These books, Desire of Ages, these are the Conflict the Ages series, nine volumes of testimonies. Then you have books like Ministry of Healing, uh, um, Thoughts and Mind of Blessing, uh, Christ Object Lessons. There are 26 original books that she wrote. Now you can add in the four Spirit of Policy volumes and so on. It's all what she wrote from cover to cover, not compilations. If you read these books, they're going to give you a clear understanding of what truth is. You're going to be able to see to a clear degree what the message of Daniel Revelation is telling you that you should know. And as you go back, you can start to study with your concordance and find where these teachings are leading you. This is why you see me presenting this concept of Revelation protocols and showing the book of Daniel and Revelation, going through these chapters and showing these t things line upon line with the Bible alone. Because this is the teaching, this is the method of preparing a people to understand these truths, to see where we should be in method doing the work of the last days. This is the prayer of Christ being realized to bring workers in the harvest. Because Christ didn't just pray. He said, fast and pray. And pray that God would send workers. Let's pray that even now. As we look at all that we studied before and even this message, that God would send laborers. God would send through these laborers a fulfillment of this because this is how the labor is going to come. We're praying that this educational work, these schools of the prophets be reestablished, that true missionary colleges will be seen among us again, health centers, publishing work, even in a self-supporting fashion like Elijah did or even like Samuel did because it needed to be done. Brothers and sisters, let's get our house in order. Our literal house and our churches and ourselves, our temples in order. Many are dying because they don't believe that the flu or coronavirus, whatever you even call it, they don't believe it's serious. Oh, we're gonna, 99% of recovery. You can recover from a gunshot wound too. But understand this, if you are drinking two and three liters of Dr. Pepper and strawberry Fanta. Do you really think your immune system is going to, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to get inoculation, brothers and sisters. You don't want to get inoculation because you're scared of what's in it. But you're not scared of what's in that Dr. Pepper. You're not scared of what's inside that strawberry Fanta or that a &W root beer. And you're drinking that like it's, like it's water to a camel and you wonder why you're going to get the flu and everything else. You're going to lay down in the grave. It's going to kill you. It's time to lose weight. 
It's time to get your blood pressure down. It's time to get your diabetes under control. It is time to get your house in order. This is why God had these places of education and also healing that God's people could be educated and helped. This is why I have a ministry not called Daniel Revelation, because I teach it, but gospel of health. Because the gospel and health is needed now. The gospel and health is needed now. This is the final work. This is what we are putting our money into. This is what we're trying to establish, that there could be revival, that others may see this, and there's others out there trying to do it. All over the world, and this movement would cause not only individual revival, but a worldwide revival. People would see this light, this ensign raised up for Christ, and would flow to it. Let's pray that God would send laborers. Let's God pray that God would send these type of laborers for this type of labor that Christ's method could be seen in every city, in every part of the world, that the end may come. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would help these words, these feeble words, to make a difference in the hearts and minds of your people. Lord, by the power of your cross, by thy riven side, by thy two copious streams of blood and water, Lord, we pray for that substitutionary death and that substitutionary life, for that cleansing from sin and that empowering strength to live righteously. Lord, we pray that that blood and that water would purify us, and strengthen us, cleanse us, and give us new life. Cleansing stream, I see, I see, I plunge it. Oh, it cleanses me. Oh, praise the Lord. It cleanses me. Cleanses me. Yes, cleanses me, the songwriter said. Lord, make this our experience. Cleanse us from the patterns of ministry that we have seen that have not been according to your way. Help those that have left places where apostasy reigns to just mimic that same form and fashion in home churches and in various self-supporting congregations. Lord, be with those that are in small churches, trying out the light wherever they may be, or even under conferences, but they are still mimicking the same pattern of apostasy that have caused many to go in the wrong way and to follow traditional ideas of evangelism rather than God's method. Help us, dear God, to see the way that you would have us to work and work as God would give us understanding to do a work as Elijah did, as John the Baptist did, as Jesus did, even if it costs us to be removed from church connection or kicked out or seen as being a troubler in Israel. Lord, raise up laborers. Raise up school of the prophets. Raise up places where the ceiling can be poured out the early and latter rain. And Lord, help us to be a part of both receiving and giving this word, even in the hearts and minds, this heart religion, that we may enter into the promised land and be maintained there by the early and latter rain. We ask in Jesus' name. We thank thee and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, we've tarried long. I pray that you have been blessed by this series of talks one by one by one. Please go back and look at it again. Please share it with others. Help people understand not only what we're doing and what we're going to put our money toward, but what all people need to be doing that name the name of Christ under these three years' message. May God bless you. You'll see a blue screen coming up shortly and where you can reach out to us, inform us of what you're doing, and also donate to help forward finance and finish the work. Help the cause. God bless you. Hope to see you soon. Keep us in prayer. Keep our programs and our new digital and practical work we're working on. Some great messages coming up soon. Pray for us. Maranatha.